Hi again! This module covers the songwriting team of Adler and Ross, and in the second part, uh, the composer Jerry Bach. Uh, Adler and Ross, the first part of today's lecture, were two individuals who worked together. Uh, Richard Adler only just died recently in, 19, in uh, 2012, and Jerry Ross, who lived from 1926 to just 1955. And unlike a lot of the people that we talk about as songwriting teams, Adler and Ross are just a little bit different in that they did not they insisted that they be credited as both composer and both as lyricist. In other words, they didn't like to make it clear who wrote the words to a given song or who wrote the melody. Although I will have to tell you that just a little bit of research and a little bit of inference can give you some, some closer ideas on perhaps the way that they both worked. Um, Richard Adler was born in New York City uh, in 1923. Uh, he was the only son of a very well-known pianist and uh, music teacher named Clarence Adler. Uh, he went to grammar school in New York City, um, served in World War II with the Navy in the Pacific. Um, he had really no musical education, although uh, his father was a famous pianist. He could not read music, he could not play except by ear. In this respect, he's kind of similar to Frank Lesser. And um, Frank Lesser, who is considered to have been sort of a guardian angel for the Adler and Ross uh, songwriting team, he may have taken a sort of a shining to him knowing that they had so many things in common. Um, although he had so little education, he was still a great idea man, and he was really good at coming up with, like, here's an idea for a tune, and perhaps singing it to somebody who could play a little bit more skillfully, and having that person play it on the piano and transpose it uh, into sheet music. Now, Jerry Ross was also born in New York City. He was born in March of 1926, and as a boy, uh, he was a part of a lot of Yiddish uh, stage productions. Uh, with, and, and Yiddish motion pictures. The, the Jewish and particularly Yiddish-speaking community uh, in New York in the mid-20th century was a thriving and really powerful chapter of the American theater experience. They had their own films, their own stage plays, their own uh, dramatic societies. This was an extraordinarily connected uh, uh, theater community. And the strange thing is that a lot of Yiddish theater was never really translated, so we don't have these plays as plays in the English language that can be, you know, that can be performed. It's kind of odd that, that few of them really have. Um, in his particular case, he um, uh, wrote music and, and uh, attended uh, uh, taking courses in music at New York University. And after graduation, he wound up working for something that has been called in slang terms the Borscht Circuit um, in the Catskill Mountains. There was a lot of segregation, as you know, in um, America in the 20th century. And one of those segregations, in addition to, I'm sure, those that you're very familiar with, another, uh, was that there were a lot of vacation areas that did not want any Jewish patrons to be a part of their, um, their community. And as a result, in the case of most uh, Jewish uh, communities, the, th those folks tended to start their own hotels and their own resorts and their own even neighborhoods. And in those resorts, which had a very specific sort of layout, they seemed seem to spring out a lot in the Catskill Mountains of New York. You would have a large central sort of a lodge and a lot of cabins circling it and you would have live performances, some sort of live music that would be a part of the vacation experience. And in there, uh, these were not cheap. These were, were very well-to-do folks who were in these places. One of them, um, a man named Eddie Fisher, uh, discovered Jerry Ross writing and playing music and said, you should be introduced to other people. Mr. Fisher was uh, a, ver a very successful actor, a very successful producer, one of many people who were married to Elizabeth Taylor. And in Fisher's case, he, he brought first Ross back to New York to perform and write, and he also introduced him to another mutual friend in, in Jerry Adler. I'm, I'm sorry, in Richard Adler. And together they became a team. It was a unique uh, collaboration, and this is a page from a letter um, that uh, Richard Adler wrote. He said, it's impossible to say who does what and when. We have rules. If I come in with what I think is a beautiful idea and he says I don't like it, I can scream, I can rave, but it's out. It obviates arguments. There has to be a unanimity in our operation. And for a while, uh, the two of them produced an awful lot of material for several singers, for acts, and, uh, in, in the, the dying final days of vaudeville. Um, they worked for a radio giveaway program called Stop the Music, and finally, doing all of this, they attracted our, um, our friend from the last lecture, Mr. Frank Lesser. Lesser was trying to start his own company, as I might have mentioned to you last time. Uh, it was Music Theater International. And the idea behind MTI was supposed to be not only that it would take shows that were from Broadway and make their scripts and scores available to amateurs so that they could make money having them produced everywhere else, 
They also, uh, uh, Lesser also wanted to discover new talent and, and, and make that stuff available both to Broadway and the amateur people simultaneously. And he gave them an assignment. He said, I, I'd like to, to hire you um, and to do so. I'd like you to work on a show for me. The show they originally worked on called Almanac opened in 1953 and was not very successful. Um, but their compilation did lead to really two tremendously successful pieces from the 1950s, which we're going to speak about a little bit in this lecture here. Uh, one of them, The Pajama Game in 1954, and the other, Dan Yankees, just a year later in 1955. Uh, tragically, this partnership came to a very abrupt end in 1955, late 55. Um, uh, Jerry Ross uh, passed away. He had, uh, he had leukemia and uh, another form of lung disease at the same time. He was very ill. And after 1955, Richard Adler never really caught on with another collaborator. And many people think that it might have been Ross who was doing a lot of the heavy lifting on these composers uh, and, and putting these songs together um, and just using uh, Dick Adler as an idea man, as what if we had a song about this? Or, what if this little melody worked this way? But there's not a lot of evidence of, of Adler doing any of the songwriting. There's also reason to believe that Frank Lesser, in his incredible desire for his first uh, discovery to make it and be successful, he may have ghostwritten some of the material and some of the music, particularly a song called Hey There, which appears in the Pajama Game. Uh, he may have at least helped them, if not actually outright worked on the song and denied himself credit so that his protégés could, uh, could be a little bit more successful. Um, a great deal of fresh talent comes out in the pajama game in 1954. You have another early uh, Bob Fosse piece of work. Uh, you have um, the producers Hal Prince and Robert Griffiths, who would both be major names even right up to today for Hal Prince on Broadway. And George Abbott, our friend, the super centenarian George Abbott, uh, directing this piece. Um, and the cast, including John Raitt, who is also famous for playing Curly in an early production of Oklahoma. It also starred a woman named Carol Haney. And here's one of those stories that I think is right out of legend. This is the kind of stuff you hear they make up all the time. Carol Haney was a very successful singer and dancer and, and actress in the 1950s and performed in the, the pajama game. One day, Carol Haney broke her leg, um, falling down a flight of stairs, I believe, and was, was injured. And in a rush, her understudy was put on stage, just like in the movies, right? Her understudy was a young woman named Shirley MacLaine. Um, her brother is Warren Beatty. You may know her as uh, the, the big reincarnation uh, advocate, she writes books about bad an awful lot these days, but she was also in a number of films, including the Oscar-winning Terms of Endearment. Um, she got a huge break when Carol Haney was injured. It's kind of the classic story of, oh, stars, you're gonna go out there, the understudy, you're gonna come back the star. Um, one of the notions with Hey There from the Pajama Game, uh, it bears up a theory that Frank Lesser had, perhaps because he had been raised in a, um, in a classical music environment at times. The idea was if you were to take a piece of classical music, write words for it, and slightly change the time signature or the tempo, you could turn it into a show tune, and no one would know that it wasn't an old song. Hey There is actually a Mozart piece that Lesser had said to Adler and Ross, why don't you take this and kind of fiddle with it, you can change it into something else. It's also a little bit unique, I think it's one of the few Broadway duets that a person can sing with himself. Um, it features this character. Pajama Game is about labor relations, believe it or not, at the sleep tight pajama factory. And there's a, uh, a strike that's being threatened um, because the folks aren't being paid enough. And there's a man named Sid who's sort of going to represent one side of the strike, and Babe, who's a woman who's representing the other side of the strike. Of course, eventually they kind of hit it off. But um, the main character sings a song about how futile it is to have a crush on somebody called Hey There. He also has a, a desk uh, tape recorder, and he's supposed to have recorded some of his thoughts and then plays them back. And they play sort of in conjunction with the melody. Of course, I don't know of anyone who's ever directed Pajama Game who's been successfully able to tie that timing of that recording just right with the orchestra and the singer. So nine times out of ten, that's a live person backstage with a microphone who just happens to sound a lot like the star. I'm going to be linking for you uh, in today's module um, a piece from uh, Harry Connick Jr. playing this part and doing this duet from himself 
uh, on stage in pajama game, and uh, you can judge for yourself if, if the trick works uh, or not. Um, in addition to that, Pajama Game gives you a song like Steam Heat, which is an early Bob Fosse piece. A lot of fun. Um, several of these early Adler and Ross shows would give Bob Fosse at least one number that did not really move the, the plot forward particularly well, and just kind of paused the show and gave us an excuse to dance. And in the case of, um, of this piece, you're talking about a big talent show and a song called Steam Heat. This is probably some of the Fosse, if you know his work at all, that you would recognize, and we'll show you a little piece of that as well in the connected module. Um, Bob Fosse is also um, visible in the film version of Damn Yankees, and when I talk about that in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but not a terribly handsome young man was Bob Fosse. Uh, he suffered from scoliosis as a child. You know, maybe that's why a lot of his characters and his choreography is full of bent over people in strange positions. Bob Fosse sort of looks like what would happen if you had like the Photoshop ability to take a person's head and go to a click and drag and bring it like a little bit lower in front of their shoulder blades for some reason. Um, but he was a heck of a dancer and it's one of those cases where choreography sometimes looks better on the person who cre created it than almost anyone else. Um, the piece in 1955 that was the follow-up to uh, the pajama game was a piece called Damn Yankees. Um, that comes to us from a novel, a novel entitled The Year the Yankees Lost the Pennant, written by a man named Douglas Balk. And Damn Yankees is an adaptation of something that goes way back in the theater. We're talking back to Europe, back to the Middle Ages and Renaissance, a little bit before the Renaissance, and that's what is known as the Faust legend. Some of you may be familiar with either Johann Goethe's Faust, or perhaps the Christopher Marlowe, Dr. Faustus. We have a long history in the theater of treatments uh, about this particular legend, the devil and Daniel Webster and this sort of thing. It's basically the notion that a person could literally sell his or her soul to the devil in exchange for something that they want. And these stories always involve the person saying, if I could have this one thing, and the devil personified gives them that, shows up later to collect the soul, you know, this, this kind of thing goes all the way back to Goethe and, and probably beyond that because he had been working on certain folk tales and ideas like that. And in the case of Damn Yankees, uh, this is a, a Faustian legend that is set against the dynasty of the New York Yankees um, in the 1940s and 50s. Um, for those of you who think that the Yankees are, uh, they're not as much of a monopoly as they used to be, but there was a time. If you're sick of seeing the same team win, and maybe that's why you're bored with sports or something, you might be, you might have been really bored uh, knowing that the Yankees won the American League pennant every single year consecutively from 1947 to 1953, took a break and missed it by just a hair in 54, and then returned for 55, 56, 57, and 58. Um, Douglas Wallop was a sports writer. And he was intrigued with the notion that the Yankees could win so often. And he wrote a story about a young man who offers to sell his soul if the Yankees could just lose the American League pennant at least once. He is a, he is a fan in the musical of another team, uh, the Washington Senators, who are a terrible team. They became the Minnesota Twins, one set of Senators. They put them in, in Washington again. That failed. They became the Texas Rangers. It's a team in Washington now. We'll see how they do. In any case, he says, oh, I would give anything if, if you know, the Yankees could lose. And the devil offers him a deal and says, not only will I give you the chance to have your team win, uh, but you yourself can personally help. And he transforms Joe, this main character, into a younger, handsome, athletic version of himself that he allows to try out for the team and become a star baseball player. This would normally be the dream for a lot of folks, but Joe is married and happily married. He has a heartbreaking scene where he comes back to his house because he misses his home, but his wife doesn't know who he is. And he's this 20-year-old kid who walks in and she just hits him over the head and chases him away and he doesn't know what to do. He asks to take to get out of the deal, and the devil basically conjures up another of his minions, a character named Lola, one of the great characters in theater, uh, to kind of seduce Joe and convince Joe that he should stay. This is where the song Whatever Lola Wants comes from. Uh, little Brains, A Little Talent, which I'll attach to this module in particular to that. Um, 
Lola doesn't quite succeed, and she is so moved by Joe's devotion to his wife that she, in turn, decides to team up with him instead, and the two of them will trip the devil, because the deal is that this guy is going to stay in this young body for a certain amount of time, and if he gives up, he gets changed back to old Joe. What she does is she distracts the devil, gives him some sort of a pill, so he falls asleep for a while, and on the last day of the season, Joe puts his glove up in the air out in the outfield, and the last out says, nope, I want out, and it's changed into old Joe, but still his glove's in the right spot, makes the last catch, makes the last out, they still win the pennant. I guess people watching TV must have been really baffled, because suddenly there's this old fat guy on this field, where, where, where did that guy come from? Joe goes home, he goes home to his wife. I think one of the real strange sort of holes in the plot, as far as I'm concerned, is Joe shows up at, the, the, at his wife's door and says, honey, I'm back and I'm so sorry. And she throws her arms around him and welcomes him back. I don't know about you, I think Joe, if this is a baseball season, that means Joe's been completely missing from April until October. And then he just shows up and says, I'm back. And he doesn't get on the head with a frying pan or something, I don't know. Well, anyhow, all, all ends well, and Damn Yankees becomes a huge success. As I said, it was revived as recently as 1994 with the ageless George Abbott uh, working on it at the same time. And it became Adler and Ross's biggest hit. Uh, it, it has been made into a film, and as I mentioned a moment ago, you can see Bob Fosse himself briefly dancing in a number in it called Who's Got the Pain. Uh, you can also see the original Lola, an actress named Gwen Verdon, a legend, if particularly the dance business, and a real inspiration for Mr. Fosse. Uh, Fosse went through a few people that he sort of particularly designed choreography for. Of course, in most cases, they were lovers as well. And Gwen Verdon was one of those people. She was mostly legs, almost entirely. She's a very small person, it's really long leg. And was just the right look for what that, that 50s into the, all the way into the late 60s, that sort of ideal was for a, for a dancer type. Um, she also became kind of an authority on Fosse's work, although she and Fosse had an on-again, off-again relationship and it didn't always work out so well. Um, she's also seen in the film, she had to fight very hard to be cast in the film. Uh, some felt, again, that she was a little too old or, too, or not quite famous enough, but in this case they relented. Uh, perhaps that's why the film didn't do as well, I, I don't know. Um, after uh, Jerry Ross passed away, Richard Adler worked on a few tiny projects, but mostly retired and was content to cash his checks. Sort of a two-hit wonder. Um, the money that they made for the rights through MTI rentals of both Pajama Game and uh, Damn Yankees kept Adler in, in the money for quite some time. And he passed away, as I said, only a few years ago in uh, 2012. Uh, when we return, I will talk to you about Jerry Bach and another important composer of the really the late 50s, but more the 60s. Uh, that's next. Thanks so much for staying with us. <laughs>